Hello, this is uh, Mark Tooley, president of the uh, Institute on Religion and Democracy, and I have the pleasure of talking with my friend uh, Michael McCurry, who uh, teaches at Wesley Theological Seminary in uh, Washington, uh, D.C., and whom I've had the privilege of knowing uh, about 12 years. I first heard him uh, speak in a Methodist context at the uh, 2004 General Conference in Pittsburgh, where he um, addressed a lunch meeting of the Methodist Federation for Social Action, about which I wrote, and then he was kind to uh, attend my uh, book party at the uh, 2008 General Conference in uh, Fort Worth. So we've kept in contact uh, over the years, and uh, obviously I'm on the conservative side of Methodism, and Mike is more on the progressive side, uh, but we have many commonalities. Uh, he is a, uh, besides his uh, seminary teaching, he's also, I believe, a Sunday school teacher at his uh, suburban Maryland church. And I think he and I are largely agreed about uh, the impending um, division of the United Methodist Church. We regret its necessity, but we anticipate it will happen. And uh, I think he and I both agree that it's probably for the best uh, for the vast majority of uh, United Methodists. But before we uh, delve into uh, Methodist controversies, Mike, I have to ask you, uh, how is the seminary and how are you doing uh, amid uh, pandemic? Well, we are, you know, obviously doing our teaching by Zoom, and I've had to kind of learn some new skills as a professor because it's a little tough to uh, kind of keep your students awake when they're just sitting there in front of their computer screens. But, uh, you know, we have, we're, we're adapting pedagogy to, you know, be relevant to the times that we're in, and that may be a new norm. I mean, we may never come out to a place where we are doing the same sort of things. You know, Wesley Seminary has a lot of transient students who come in from other places around the Mid-Atlantic region. And if they get accustomed to doing classes and stuff by remote control or by Zoom or by, you know, internet, they may sort of say, well, that's like a lot better deal for us. So maybe that's the way the new normal should be. So we, they'll be coming out of this there will be some real questions about you know how do you structure theological education and what what should it look like and i think that'll be a that'll be a big challenge and you know the seminaries as you know mark are not doing particularly well now we we were holding our own at wesley theological seminary we have got you know our finances have been basically pretty strong but we're going into a major depression now and you know, what happens and what, what are the sor sources of support? You know, uh, how's that gonna work? I mean, I, mean, I gotta believe IRD's got some of those same issues too. So, you know, what, you know how, how do we sustain support for the kinds of discussions and dialogue that matters uh, in these times? And I think it's gonna be a very, very difficult question. Well, lots of big issues ahead and hopefully uh, ultimately more good news uh, than bad, but we'll just have to persevere no matter what happens. Well, Mike, I have to ask you about uh, the topic uh, at hand for United Methodism, at least uh, before the virus uh, intervened and all of us came to a virtual halt in that uh, in January, <coughs> the, uh, what's called uh, the protocol was uh, unveiled, agreed to by caucus groups across the spectrum and a number of bishops uh, that essentially would uh, divide United Methodism into two and possibly more than two uh, denominations. Um, are you basically uh, favorable towards that project? I, you know, I, I know a lot of the people who worked on that uh, effort to bring that protocol together. My, uh, one of my good friends is Bishop Tom Bickerton, who is one of the leaders of that. Um, you know, I, we are, we're going to enter into a period in where there are different expressions of Methodism and how it looks and how we celebrate what we think of as the Wesleyan tradition. And I, you know, I, 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 think, I think that ends up in a pretty good place at the end of the day. I think there are going to be traditional churches that are more orthodox and have a more fundamental view on issues, but they, most of these issues are contemporary. They're not really, you know, they don't go back to Wesley. They don't go back to you know, if you think of the the Wesley quadrilateral, you know, and he was, his scripture was the most important, and then reason, experience, tradition, those are the things that really form and make what a church experience is supposed to be. And I think, 
that, that's going to that's going to prevail, and it's going to prevail maybe in different expressions now of different Methodism. But I, you know, I, I, frankly, I don't worry much about it. like okay, the United Methodist Church is going to have some third or however many people of you know the denomination leave because they're going to go set up something new and you know at the end of the day it's all about worshiping god and expressing who we are and living out the beliefs we have and 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 more importantly putting those faith beliefs in action in the community at a time in which we really really need people of faith to step up and be engaged and uh you know, I I think our little political squabbles in the United Methodist Church will not be nearly as important as what comes out at the end of the day, which is how are we going to put our faith into motion? You know, with, with, with what we call praxis. How do we put, you know, how do we put our true beliefs into motion and into action and in how we serve the community? And I, you know, look, you and I have been on opposite sides of many different kinds of issues, but I think we we both believe that we need to be engaged in the community and doing the best we can to live out our faith as we serve the communities that we serve. And and that's true regardless of where you are on the political spectrum. And you know, I, I think you and I have always appreciated that commonality that we have. It must be uh, a somewhat anxious time for some of your students. I assume a majority of your students are United Methodists, and they're going potentially into a denomination entering um, a fracture. Are they uh, concerned and distressed? Well, we have, you know, we are multi-denominational. So we, I'd say about half of our students are Methodists, and then most of them are other, you know, uh, liberal Protestant uh, denominations for the most part. But they're, they're worried because they're, you know, churches are, as, as you know, as I know, uh, they're in decline, their memberships are down, congregations are shrinking, and so the number of <clears throat> clergy appointments that are available are shrinking. And so many of them are thinking of other ways that they might live out their ministry and other kinds of faith advocacy work, uh, places where they could go serve. You know, since we're here in Washington, we have a lot of people who are interested in working on Capitol Hill or working in federal agencies. So we have other places where they can, you know, live out their faith in a different kind of vocational calling. And uh, I think that's going to be the norm going forward. It's not necessarily going to be in a local parish or local congregational setting. Do you think, um, is there a wide uh, diversity among your students, theologically and politically, or would a strong majority be more on the progressive side? Yeah, we are, you know, look, I mean, you know Wesley Theological Seminary pretty well, and I would say the predominant uh, voices on our campus are more are on the liberal progressive side. However, one of the things that, and I've been very insistent on this, given my own background, because everyone says, oh, it is Bill Clinton guy, you know, what, what is he doing on the faculty here? I've been really, really insistent on encouraging more conservative voices. Um, you and I are good friends with Ryan Danker, who's uh, one of our faculty members. He's got a, actually got a good, good book coming out. You ought to promote that book at some point. But the, you know, there we we need to have other voices and expose students to other. Uh, points of view, and I am really, really insistent on that. We we do a lot of stuff. Uh, I, Mark, you may know T Tim Gogline from Focus on the Family, yeah, probably. Sure. Uh, so we just had him as a guest in in our seminar at Wesley Seminary recently, and he and I are very, very good friends. And I think the importance of bringing other conservative voices or different points of view and different perspectives into theological education is part of the formative transition that has to happen because, you know, we're sending pastors out who are going to be, you know, they're going to face pews that have got people of all different political stripes and different points of view. And they need to be able to, you know, have conversations that are coherent and important with all of them. And I think that, that, that's a rich tradition that kind of goes back to John Wesley in many ways. Uh, and, and 
that that's something that we ought to, you know, really enshrine in the way in which we kind of practice and teach our, you know, uh, theologians of the future. If uh, the denomination uh, does divide at the now postponed general conference that will occur sometime <laughs> in 2021. What, what, what's the deal? What's the, like, there's no general conference. <laughs> I, 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 well, what will we do with the month of May now? <laughs> this agonizing uh, delay. But uh, when it's all sorted out, do you think, would you anticipate, if you have to guess, that uh, Wesley would try to uh, serve uh, all of the uh, various Methodist denominations to the extent possible? Yeah, I think, I think we have a very, very strong commitment. We are a, you know, a Methodist affiliated uh, institution founded by Bishop Axnam in 1958 when he brought the, he wanted, in, he wanted a seminary in Washington, D.C. And it was certainly not you know, designed to be of any one political persuasion. And, and we've got a very, very strong commitment. And I personally have a very strong commitment in saying we've got to expose, you know, the students who are going to go out and serve the church and whatever ministries they, they pursue to a lot of different viewpoints. And, uh, you know, I think that's a fundamental part of theological education to really, you know, both in theology and also in you know, what we call public theology, expose our students to a lot of different viewpoints. And we do that. And, you know, sometimes it drives some of my more liberal faculty members crazy when I tell them, I'm going, we're, here's who we're going to have on campus. <laughs> we're, a, you know, an appearance. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think that's part of what education, higher education, graduate education and theology ought to look like. Well, uh, for uh, viewers who are younger than myself and don't remember the exciting days of the 1990s, uh, <laughs> Michael just uh, referenced that uh, he, of course, was uh, the press spokesman for uh, President uh, Bill Clinton and was a very uh, high um, profile uh, person during some uh, controversial times. So that he later went to seminary and even became a seminary professor is an unusual vocational trajectory. Uh, but uh, I'm sure yeah. your students appreciate your background. Mark, that's called the doctrine of atonement. Right. <laughs> or perfection as you move forward. Right? <laughs> yeah, moving, moving towards perfection. Right. But, uh, but, you know, I do think, you know, in the Wesleyan tradition, and since we are, you know, Wesleyan Methodists, you know, that Wesley was really all about, you, you started with scripture and the fundamental importance of scripture, but then you also brought in reason, experience, the tradition of the church, those were the things that kind of put a composite experience around what it meant to be a Christian believer and to live in community. And uh, I think we try to, we, we, we try to do that. And I, you know, as, as a seminary called Wesley Theological Seminary, it's probably important to be true to that Wesleyan experience. And we, we really do try to live that out. Well, finally, Mike, uh, let me ask you about a project you participated in uh, a couple of years ago with uh, Ryan Danker on uh, Wesleyan political theology with a uh, conference held uh, at the seminary, and now a book has come out with the uh, presentations, uh, including your own. Do you see this as a field where there, there will be uh, further work in the Methodist world in terms of uh, developing a specifically Wesleyan political theology? Yeah, I just looked up and I want to give a, Ryan a shout out for his new book and it's exploring a Wesleyan political theology and it's coming out. I believe it's going to be, I think it's available maybe on Amazon already, but um, you know, he is, he, he is a more conservative theologian, uh, important to have voices and perspective like that. And I think, you know, how we bring people into conversations where they reach across whatever political divides we have. We are, you know, we are, Mark, we're in such a polarized time. And one of the great joys that I've had is you and I are clearly on different sides of the political and theological spectrum, but you and I have always had a very good conversation and good times to have discourse together. And I think modeling that and figuring out how we how we teach people to have those kinds of conversations in what we call the public square is a very, very important 
uh, thing that we ought to be doing, both in the seminary where we teach and then in the public discussions that we have. And the more that we can kind of create authentic and real and loving conversations with people who disagree with each other, maybe, but, but still want to have some kind of conversation where we try to wrestle with the important issues. I think that is like a vital skill that we need to uh, be able to develop. And I appreciate what you do on that front. And I know that you and I will be working on that as we go forward. Well, thank you, Miles. It's been, uh, it's been a very enjoyable conversation. And uh, hopefully, certainly we'll be reconnecting uh, before a general conference convenes, uh, whenever that will be. Yeah, whenever general conference is. I mean, I mean, it's, it's a good question. Let me, you know, would not to go over time here, but w what is going to happen? I mean, what, you know, what in the United Methodist Church, uh, you know, we have, we had, we reached a, I think a pretty good place, which is we figured out a way to do an amicable divorce and that people could kind of go their separate ways, depending on where they were. And I think they were going to codify that, but, but now with the general conference delayed or postponed or whatever, you know, wh what happens do you think? Well, it seemed like the consensus was growing, and I don't see any major reasons why that consensus would be disrupted at this point. Do you? I, I, I don't. I mean, I think they, <clears throat> the, the people who help, helped put together what we call the protocol, the way in which we were going to move forward and figure out ways in which people could, you know, set up uh, their own expression of Methodism in whatever they wanted to do, if it was kind of a new denominational structure of some sort, I, th I thought that made a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, I, I give a lot of credit. And I know most of the people who worked on that effort. And I think, you know, there was a very representative thing. It's like, you know, we need more of that, by the way, in our uh, American political system, people from different points of view coming together and working together and coming up with some kind of common solution. But, uh, but we need to codify it somehow. I mean, it has to be there a lot of things, including changing the constitution of the Methodist Church, a lot of things in the Book of Discipline that have to be altered and changed, and those, those, those require legislative actions, and we got to have some way in which, you know, some, somebody can meet or somebody can meet and do it uh, and, and get this process moving forward, but uh, the, this virus has put all of us in a place where we're having to invent new ways of doing everything from living to breathing to, to, you know, just doing the very business that we are involved in in our vocation. And it, it's a very, very challenging time, but, it, but hopefully it brings out the best of us at the end of the day. And I also hope this additional year or year and a half of uh, reflection and anticipation about division gives uh, a lot of us individually and congregationally time to, work it out in our minds and to prepare. And uh, I'm telling friends, uh, if you have to move from one church to another, whatever happens, uh, don't be bitter, don't be angry, just see this as a, a welcome end to a, a long uh, conflict. And uh, whatever you do, do it with peace. Right, I mean, see it as an opportunity. We've been debating, um, and the, the proximate issue is homosexuality, and we've been debating that now since what, 1972, 1974, as a church, and we've been stymied by it. But this is really a way for us to move forward and to have people have different expressions and reflect whatever their their personal congregational church beliefs are on this. And uh, you know, I I I I think good work was done. I think the Lord's work was done in giving us a solution to move forward. It's just like, but you know, it, it's we're in that kind of not yet time because we can't quite codify it until we get to some kind of time in which we do that, but, but we'll figure it out. We will. Thank you, Mike, and I hope you and I both are able to get haircuts sometime very soon. Yeah, I know, I know. I look, I'm, my wife said I'm, I'm very shaggy because there's no barbershop open anywhere in Maryland. <laughs> you may be taking on a Bernie Sanders type look eventually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right, take care. I hope to see you physically sometime soon when uh, we get back to normalcy. Good. I would enjoy that, Mark. Thanks, Mike. Take care. Good. Bye bye.